transition out of a place of warfare into a place of deeper worship. I feel like many of you right now are coming out of a last season and you feel a little bit rattled, but God is bringing you into the new season refreshed and restored. And I feel like the Lord has us standing on the edge of something today. Something that is beyond what we've seen or known or ever comprehended. There's a lot of swirl in the earth. There's a lot of swirl in the atmosphere of our lives and of the nation right now. But the one who's in charge, he's, he's not just in control, but he's in charge today, is ruling with righteousness. He's ruling with justice. And I feel like right now that God is distributing justice in the room today. Justice for sickness is healing. Justice for poverty is provision. Justice for being bound up is deliverance. Justice for brokenness is wholeness. And I just feel like right now the justice of God is in the room. And I feel like some of you right now, it's like the Lord is coming with a gavel and it's like He's ruling in your behalf. He's overruling and overturning the, the, the judgments of the enemy and the judgments of the world against you. And God is ruling on your behalf. I just keep hearing that today. Overruled, overruled, overruled. Your sickness is being overruled. Your depression is being overruled. Your fear is being overruled. Come on, right now I feel faith rising in the room. This room is pregnant today with miracles you don't have to do anything but receive it come on some of you right now he wants you to know you're positioned under an open heaven I know sometimes we pray Lord rend the heavens but they're already open today I just keep seeing him as the God of the open hand he's not trying to hold something back from us he's releasing what's in his hand over us brother I've seen you the last couple of weeks and I saw the Lord's eyes like fixed on you. And I felt like he was, he, he was like a, an expectant and an excited father watching a son from the stands. And I felt like the, it was like I kept seeing him cheer for you. And the interesting thing was he was cheering for you even at moments where you weren't doing anything. You were standing there, you were resting, you were just hanging out. And it's like I saw him cheering you on in those moments and I felt like the Lord said it's not for what you've done or anything that you will do but it's simply for who you are and I feel like that who you are is about to encounter an I am moment and every place where you feel less than the Lord says that I have made you more than and I felt like the Lord said that he's anointed you as one who coaches and mentors others but I felt like the Lord said that I put dreams and visions on the inside of you for ministry. And I felt like the Lord was like shifting a gear into drive, like, like the same way that you would shift a transmission from park to drive. I felt like the Lord said that I'm putting you into overdrive this summer. And I said, Lord, what's that about? And he said, he's been in pursuit of me. And when you seek, you find. And when you ask, it's given. And when you knock, the doors are open. And I felt like this is going to be a season to be to be in his presence, a season to be in the right place. And I felt like the Lord has anointed you to help people erase their question marks where they've doubted experiences with God or where they've doubted the power of the Holy Spirit or the fullness of God. I felt like the Lord said, you're going to bring them into a place of experience. And I felt like there's a boldness in you, but also a gentleness. It's like you're a gentle giant. And I feel like that even as you're sitting here alone today, I felt like the Lord said, uh, you're the first of many. You're the first of many. And I feel like the Lord wants you to know that you have His full attention today. I feel like right now there's about to be a thread of salvation that's going to run through your family. A thread of salvation that's going to run from generation to generation to generation. And Lord, I just bless this amazing young man today. Lord, I ask that the heavens would stay open, be opened over his life. Lord, let those angels ascend and descend today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, there's a stirring right now. There's a stirring. Come on, let faith stir up on the inside of you today. I love receiving, but there's something that each of us contributes or gives into an atmosphere like this. 
And I, I don't know how to explain it. I just feel like right now, before we go any further, the Lord wants us to connect our faith together. The Bible says that one could put a thousand to flight, two, ten thousand. And there's something that happens when we enter into agreement. There's something that happens when we actually put our faith together, faith to faith. We'll go from faith to faith. Come on, every one of us brought something into the room today. Everyone brought an expectation or a faith into the room. And will you let your individual faith become corporate faith right now? Come on, I don't know how to explain it other than I feel like right now we're just supposed to release release what we brought today. Come on, would you just connect your faith with one another right now in Jesus' name? Here's how we're going to do it. Just for 30 seconds, we're going to pray in the Holy Spirit. Come on, right now, there's a fresh baptism of love. There's a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's a, there's a unity of spirit right now in the room. Don't underestimate the power of the moment. Come on, I feel there's a unity, a togetherness in the spirit like I haven't ever felt before. Come on, there's something that happens when we join in. There's something that happened on the day of Pentecost when they, were in, they, they weren't just waiting and they weren't just singing and they weren't just praying, but, but they were in unity. There was this thing where, where they just came together and suddenly that everybody's expectation was joined and miracles began to happen and the spirit of God was poured out and I'm just telling you right now we've come as many individuals but if we will come as a whole today come on right now I believe something is stirring in the room right now in Jesus name come on will you just pray in the Holy Spirit you're baptized in the Holy Spirit I know it's Sunday morning but we're not ashamed in this place this morning of the baptism come on right now there's a fresh baptism of God coming if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit to be a good moment to say, God, I want everything you have for me this morning. Lord, I'm holding nothing back. Lord, I'm holding nothing. Come on, make yourself, put yourself in a place of receiving. Lord, right now, come on, connect our faith together. Lord, we come as one. We come as one body. Lord, we come and Lord, we thank you. Holy Spirit, you are the spirit of unity. You are the spirit that binds us together. Lord, we've come from different places and different households and different backgrounds and different colors and different races and maybe different ethnicities. Lord, we come from different social and economic economic backgrounds but today we come as one Lord we come as one Lord we come as one in you Lord we want to be the answer to the prayer that Jesus prayed when he said Father make them one as you and I are one come on I feel that oneness coming right now that unity in spirit that unity in the spirit of God come on let him engulf you let him envelop you let him embrace you in his heart this morning come on there's something happening right now don't miss your moment don't miss your moment don't miss your moment don't wait for the end Don't wait for the end. What if God wants the end at the beginning today? Come on, right now. Some of you are positioned over and up in open heaven. Your healing is at hand. Your miracle is at hand. Your promise is at hand. Your deliverance is at hand. Your freedom is at hand. Come on, right now. Come on, would you just join your faith in the atmosphere of this room right now? Lord, we say let heaven come. Let heaven come. Let heaven come at 5910 North W Street. Let heaven come to Jubilee this morning. Lord, we want you. We want you. We don't have any other agenda, God. We just want you. Lord, if you'll breathe on us, we will live. If you will breathe on us, you will live. If you will breathe on us, we will live, God. So, Lord, let your breath come. You are the breath in our lungs. You are the breath in our lungs. You are our very existence. You are our very existence today. Jesus, you said that you are the way. You are the truth and you are the life. That, Lord, there is no life outside of you. So, Lord, let the life of God fill this room. Flood this place today, God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. How many people agree this morning? Will you let out a shout of praise in this place? Come on, let something come out of you this morning. Come on, let there be a unity of praise in this place. Come on, praise through to your next. Praise through to your next. Praise through in your miracle. Come on, praise out of your valley. Praise your way out of your valley. Come on, praise them on the mountaintop. Praise them in the valley. Praise them in the downtime. Praise them in the uptime. Praise them when you don't feel like it this morning. Come on, let another roar come out of you. If you only knew the power of your praise this morning. If you only knew the power of your praise this morning. Come on, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Come on, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. He inhabits the praises of His people. Come on, if you'll praise Him, He'll inhabit you. If you praise Him, He won't just visit you this morning. He will possess you. He will dwell in you. Come on, well, I want to be a holy habitation of the Lord today. Come on, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. We lift you up high in Pensacola, the forward of this morning, God. 
because we know that if you would be lifted up, you would draw all men to yourself. Lord, we praise you today. Lord, we lift the roof today. We shout it from the rooftops that you are good, God. You are faithful, that you are awesome, that you are mighty, that you are great, God, that your glory covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. And we bless your name today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. You know what I just heard him say? Don't stop. Come on, don't stop. Don't stop. Come on, you're feeding him today. Come on, this is how you get intimate with God. This is how you get intimate with God. Come on, right now. He's a God that you can trust. He's a God that will touch you. But he's a God you can touch yourself. Come on, right now. Come on, don't stop. I know, right now. Come on, we're on the brink of something. Come on, don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. The king is asking. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Holy Spirit, come, Lord. Come, Lord. Come like you promised, Jesus. Inhabit our praises, God. Inhabit our praises. Come on, you are the bread. sing it one more time. You are great as the Lord. Somebody needs to breathe them in this morning. Come on, some of us need to breathe them in this morning. I've been feeling just in this moment right now, somebody's lungs are being healed. Somebody's lungs are being healed. Constriction is leaving. Inflammation is leaving. COPD is leaving. Asthma is leaving. Come on, just takes a moment. What I know about him is this. Then when you talk about him, he shows up. When you start talking about the attributes of God, he shows up. Lord, you are our breath. Holy Spirit, you are the breath of God. Lord, right now, in Jesus' name. Lord, come upon Shirley right now, in Jesus' name. Lord, open up her lungs. Lord, open up the gates to her lungs, Lord, right now. Let today be a day of deliverance. Let today be a day of healing, Lord. Lord, I felt the expectation of God when I saw her this morning. Holy Spirit, right now, fill her. Lord, I speak to her lungs. I speak to her respiratory system. I speak right now healing and life. That, Lord, you are the God who creates and you're the God who even recreates. So, Lord, I'm asking, Lord, for the creative miracle of God. Lord, right now, healing in her lungs. Lord, if she needs new lungs, give her a new pair of lungs today. A new pair of lungs. Lord, I call forth, Lord, what you've created already in heaven to come to earth. Come to Shirley right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, just take another deep breath in right now. Come on, church. He's here. He's not out there. He's not up there. He's here. And whenever he comes, he comes on purpose. He comes with purpose. He comes for purpose. Well, I feel something in this place this morning. I feel something in the atmosphere this morning. I feel his breath. I feel his wind. He, he's a God we can feel. He's a God we can feel because he's a God we can trust. Jesus, you're so good. Church, he's just that good. He's just that good. He's good when I'm bad. 
He's faithful when I'm faithless. He's still his best when I'm at my worst. Nothing I do or go through changes him. But he changes who I am and he changes what I'm going through. Come on, he's not just in control. He's in charge this morning. He's not just reacting and responding. He is ruling and reigning. I don't know how to explain it, but I feel like our praise this morning, our worship this morning is like rocket fuel to the Lord. There's something happened that the Lord is taking us higher. He's giving us a new perspective. He's allowing us to see things from a new dimension today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give God one more shout of praise this morning. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Aren't you glad for a worship team that knows how to tap into the presence of God and and willing to stay up here for hours at a time and get here early and stay late? And I certainly appreciate them. There's one thing that marks this ministry for the last 20 years that I've been here, and that's the presence of God. And um, I'm not explaining. We just stepped into something today. Come on, right now. Sometimes you just got to step into something. I feel like often that we're waiting for God to do something for us or to us when God's just waiting for us to believe. Sometimes we're waiting for God to come and do something to us or for us when He just wants us to do something for Him. Something happens when you touch Him. Something happens when you touch the hem of his garments. Something happens when you position yourself. I've been studying this out in in, in Luke chapter 8 and in Mark chapter 5, where it talks about the hem of his garment, where the woman with the issue of blood came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. I, I love that scripture, and the flow of blood stopped, and she was healed immediately and instantly. And I love those immediately's and those suddenly's and those instantly's of God, but, but I've discovered the hem of his garment uh, is, is the same word in Hebrew as was the train of his robe in Isaiah 6. The hem of his garment and the train of his robe are in this place today. When, you're, when you feel the train of his robe, it, it is the authority, the life-changing authority of God, but when you touch the hem of, of his garment, his life flows into you. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but there's some people in the room today that you felt like you came in hanging by a thread. And it's not a thread at all. It's the hem of his garment. And if you'll just pull this morning what you've been facing and what you've been walking through, even for many years now, is about to change. Come on, I feel God in the room today. My good friend, he's a prophetic voice named Bob Hazlett, sent me uh, a text yesterday morning. And... Uh, This was the text. Are you in frustration or expectation? Are you in frustration or expectation? If you've been around the last few weeks, our pastor has been preaching an amazing series of messages on expectation. Last week's message on the return of Jesus was amazing and it's timely. It's important for the day and the hour in which we live in. And what I believe is this, is that there are many people in the room today that are walking in spiritual frustration. Because you know the what, you just don't know the how. You have this idea, or maybe you have a revelation, or a prophecy, or a word over your life, but you don't know how to bring that into your reality. Kevin Leal, who preached two weeks ago, here often says these words that revelation without application leaves you in frustration. Because if you have, you can have all the revelation in the world, but until you know how to apply it to your daily life, you're going to be frustrated because nothing's happening. Here's what most prophecy is. Here's what most promises from God are. Here is what revelation is. It, it is an invitation to, to partner with God. It is an invitation to respond to what he's saying. 
If you read through the scriptures, and, and I, I hope you will go on a journey with me a little bit this morning and, and maybe through the rest of your life in this. But I love studying out the word of the Lord. I, I love studying out Bible prophecies and things that he spoke from Genesis to Revelation. And what I find in, in prophecy is this. It normally begins with if. It starts out like this. If you will, then I will. Deuteronomy chapter 28, we love the part where he says, I'll make you the head and not the tail above and not beneath. I love that. Do you love that? But it all begins with if. If you do all that I command you to do this day, then the blessings of God will overtake you. If you do all that I command you to do today, do this day, then I'll make you the head and not the tail. It it is the if, it is the it it is that two-letter word that most of us want to ignore, and we just start saying, God said it, I believe it. Well, all of that is true, but when I hear a prophecy, my first response is, What do I need to do to bring it to pass? The word of the Lord is sovereign. I'm not questioning that. But most prophecies are partnership prophecies. How how many know that God will not force you? He may make you miserable until you do what he's told you to do. But but he will not force you to do anything. Abram could could have stayed in Ur. He would have stayed prospering in Ur. He would have been okay in Ur. But his promise wasn't in Ur. It was in a land whose foundation and builder and maker was God. There is movement to the word of the Lord. The moment you can hear a prophetic word and stay sitting still, I question if maybe your ears have gone dull. There was a reason that most prophecies and encounters with angels who had a message began like this. Do not fear. Because there is an awe and a wonder to it that must be awakened in us again. I would dare to say that the church has lost its urgency in the earth because we've lost our awe and wonder of heavenly things. And so we've become dull in both places. And I believe right now that the Lord wants to set some people free from frustration. You have a word from God about changing a nation. You have a word from God about your marriage. You have a word from God about your business. You have a word from God about ministry. You have a word, all of those things. And and if I were to ask you where you are in that process, you would say, I'm waiting on God. When the truth is that God is waiting on you. Waiting on you to get up. Waiting on you to move. Waiting on you to say, yes, Lord. It may not even be what I want, but I want what you want over what I want. How many know that's not an easy prayer to pray? I've discovered that often the will of God is everything I never knew I always wanted. There is not one thing that I'm doing today that I dreamed of as a six-year-old boy. Or a 12-year-old boy or a 21-year-old man. This is not what I've picked for my life, but it's what he called and chose for me. And until I said yes to what he had planned for me, I lived in agony, misery, gloom, and despair. Because I was outside of his will, but I was also outside of his perspective. And some of you right now, God is about to bring you out of a season of frustration into a season of knowing how to apply and walk out the word of the Lord. Jesus said these words. He said that we should watch and pray. It wasn't just watch and it wasn't just pray. I know some people that are just watching. They're watching the news. They're watching the internet. They're they're watching all of the things of of presidents going here. And and this is happening in North Korea. And this is happening in Russia. And this is happening in Chicago. And this is happening in Detroit. And this is happening in Pensacola. And we're watching. But if you're going to watch, then pray while you watch. And you have to, you can't just pray either. Because if you don't watch, you don't know really what to pray for. There has never been a time in the earth like this time. There are nations in uproars right now. And you can look at it through the lens of it being all scary, or you can get really excited. If I look through, histor- through history and if I look through the Bible, every time there, there is struggles or, or warfare or, or, or collapses of nations, the gospel floods through. 
today. I work in Mozambique quite often in Southeast Africa. And, and um, people are coming to the Lord like I've never seen it. It's so much like the New Testament. And where I go is a place called Pemba, and it's in a, a, a province um, that right now is, is very intense. El Shabaab, a radical terrorist group from another faith, has, has come in there, and they don't like the fact that thousands of people are getting saved. So they're burning down entire villages, destroying churches. They're, they're killing people. And, um, uh, and so my missionary friends that have a school right now going on with 700 internationals, and they have, you know... Uh, over 150 um, missionaries on, on, on base are trying to figure out, do we go to South Africa? Do we move? Do we make a shift? Do we do, do those things? And I talked to them late last night, and we were praying. And a, a, as we were praying, this is what the missionary began to cry out. Her name is Heidi Baker. She said, the way I see it, light is never afraid of the dark, but the dark is afraid of the light. And often our first response, listen, if you watch, you would run, wouldn't you? But if you watch and pray, then you know, you know what? I'm standing my ground. Because in the words of Trey McClendon, the Lord didn't bring us all this way to fall down, quit, or turn around. He he said to occupy until he comes. And what happens is this, and I'm not underestimating the warfare, and that's greater warfare than any of us in this room will probably ever know. But what happens when opposition comes, our, our, our first instinct is fight or flight. And most of us are, all, are I'll fly away, oh glory, Christians. Somebody tweets something on Monday. We're, we're praying, Lord, I'm packing my suitcase. Come back and get me anytime, Lord Jesus. Right? You're, you're like kind of drop the sword, grab the suitcase. We're out of here. But, but the fact of the matter is that God knew what he was doing when he caused you to be born in such a time as this. He called you to be light and darkness. He called you to carry the glory of the Lord. And the great thing is... Can I tell you something? Here's what I love about the light of the Lord. It's not even my own light. It's His light that He places on the inside of me. You know where the fire is? In a fireplace. And God has ordained you and called you to be a fireplace in this season and in this time. Don't be weary with the things that you see on the news. God is moving. He's orchestrating things. He's changing things. Don't be frustrated with what you're experiencing or what you're doing. Turn your frustration into expectation. I believe this. Most of us are waiting for there when God wants to do something here. Most of us are, if I were to ask you, where are you at in the process? Well, when I get this, when, I, when, 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 when the Lord gives me the right mate, when the Lord gives me the right amount of money, when the Lord gives me this, then, then I'll be right. No, no. you you got to begin. Don't worry about what you don't have. Start with what you do have. Come on, what if you're there is here? Molly and I, uh, my wife, we went to a um, marriage retreat in Tulsa uh, back in February. And Dr. Jimmy Evans shared this word. He said, if the grass looks greener on the other side of the fence, it's time to water your own lawn. I thought that's a great word for marriages, but it's also a great word for the church. Because we're always looking for who has something better, who has something stronger, who has something more entertaining, who has something better for the kids, who has something better over here or over there. But, but what if you actually began to water the lawn? What, you, may, you may look around and say, well, Jubilee doesn't have this and Jubilee doesn't have that. Well, then start it. Start it. If there's a need that you don't see being fulfilled here, get an idea from God, come to the, come to the leaders and say, this is what I want to start. We'll, we'll back you 100%. Come on, I believe right now it's time to start watering your own lawn. Isn't that good? Come on, Hebrews 10 and 23 says, Let us hold fast our confession again to hope, for he who made the promise is faithful. It means, you know what, you you better come back to the thing that you used to confess with hope. You better hold on to hope. You better hold on to that promise. Let us hold fast our confession again to hope. What, What are you confessing? Some of us that are optimistic, we're always confessing, man, God is on the move, amazing things are happening, our city is about to be saved in a day, God's pouring out His Spirit, amazing things are happening. Pessimists are saying, I wish God would just come and wipe this whole thing out, I can't believe these people are, they're getting wickeder and wickeder and wickeder. What is it a matter of? Perspective. It's not optimist or pessimist, really, is it? It's actually in the need of hearing what God is saying right here, right now, in this place, in your life, in your family, in your city. 
Let us hold fast our confession again to hope. Can I, can I just say this to you? If you don't have a word to speak over Pensacola that's filled with faith, hope, and love, just, just don't say anything. If you don't have anything to say over your kids, over your, over your marriage, over your household, over your block, then just don't say anything until you get a word of faith, hope, and love. Because God wants to build faith. He wants to release hope. He wants to uh, pour out love in this place like never before. Jeremiah 1 and 12 says, Then the, the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. I love that because the uh, 11 verses prior to that, God speaks to, uh, speaks to Jeremiah and he said, Hey, Jeremiah, I, I've called you before the foundation of the earth. I called you to be a prophet to the nations. And Jeremiah's first response was, Oh, oh no, Lord. I can't even speak. I can't even talk right. And, and nobody's going to listen to me anyway. And, and, and Jeremiah's resistance did not thwart the plan of the Lord at all, did it? He said, don't ever say again that you're just a young man. Stop with the excuses. You're going to go to whoever I tell you to go. You're going to open your mouth. I'm going to fill it. You're going to speak to them, whatever I tell you to do. And, and this is what's going to happen. And then he, he, he moves him into a vision. That's powerful to me. He didn't say, okay, you said no. I'm going to go find somebody else. He brings him into a vision and he asks the question, what do you see? And he said, I see an almond tree budding. I see it beginning to bloom. And the word of the Lord said, you see well. You see well. Some of you right now, the Lord's asking you, what do you see? What do you see in your current circumstance or situation? What do you see in your marriage? What do you see in your church? What do you see in a city that seems like every other day there's another shooting or another this or another that? What, what do you see? Because you could see the wrong thing and miss what God is doing in the midst of it. You see well. I watch over my word day and night and I'm careful to perform it. Here's what I love about the prophetic. And you can get in awe and awe of wonder of how accurately me or our prophet Kevin or other people can, can prophesy accurately. But the fact of the matter is it was never our word in the first place. Do you understand that? It's simply the Lord saying, you see well. And I'm watching over my word day and night and I'm careful to perform it. Side note about prophecy. Prophecy is not to wow you with accuracy. It's to woo you into intimacy. It's not to say the person who gave me the word is so amazing and they know me, but it's to simply walk away saying God knows me. It draws us into intimacy. Listen, when you hear a prophetic word, would you let your ears open to know that, that God is wooing me into his heart? He's, he's sharing information from his heart and from his mind with me. 2 Corinthians 1 and 20 says, For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. I liked how Pastor B used to put it. God the Father made the promise. Jesus went to the cross and said yes by his blood. And by it we say amen. Or so be it. Come on, how many know God can't lie? God the Father made the promise. Jesus went to the cross and he, he paid for it. He said yes by his blood. All you have to do is agree with it. Come on, right now, God is bringing us into the power of agreement as a body of what He said and what He's doing. Come on, a, a few years ago, on September 11, 2016, I was in the courtyard Marriott in downtown Waterbury, Connecticut. 4.44 in the morning, the Lord wakes me up, and uh, He begins to talk to me. I think it should probably be illegal or unscriptural for the Lord to speak to me before the sun comes up, unless we're fishing together. I think it's really illegal for the Lord to ask me a question before coffee. But at 4.44 in the morning, the Lord asked me this question. The question was simple. Do you believe my word or are you just discussing it? Do you really believe what I said about you? Do you really believe what I'm saying over nations? Do you really believe what, what I'm saying over my church? Do you really believe what I'm speaking into your circumstance and situation? Or are you just discussing it? And I think what's happened is the church has entered into these discussions instead of waiting on God, pressing our ears into his heart and hearing what God is saying about every circumstance and situation. Because at the end of the day, my discussion and my opinion doesn't matter as long as God's spoken. And you will never hear God speak unless you listen. 
People ask me sometimes, David, what is the secret to hearing God? And the secret to hearing God is listening. A couple of months ago, I was on a coffee date, a Starbucks date. I call it St. Arbucks if you want to get spiritual about it, or five bucks. Um, and, and my son, uh, Joshua, he's 12. He likes to go on Starbucks dates with me because he likes really expensive coffees and frappuccinos. That uh, I don't get it, but he likes it. Uh, I like it too. But I wish he was paying for it. And uh, he talks all the time. He's always talking. And um, he's funny and all of those things. And we were about halfway to Starbucks on Nine Mile Road. And, and he wasn't saying anything. He was just looking out the window and he was smiling. And I said, hey, buddy, everything going all right? He goes, oh, it's great. I'm like, are, are you sure you're not saying anything? He goes, oh, Dad, I just like being with you. And you don't have to say anything. Uh, and I can still hear your heart. And I thought, this is the perfect picture of what prophecy is. It's being so confident in your relationship with your father that even if God isn't speaking, you're hearing what his heart's saying. And I think what happens is we, we don't just need to simplify it. We need to become more childlike. As we got to Starbucks, we began to talk. I said, son, how does God speak to you? And he said, he said dad, he speaks to me like I'm talking to you. And he said, do you know, Dad, that you would be a really, really bad dad if I asked you a question and you didn't answer me? And God would be a really, really bad God if I asked him a question and he didn't answer me. And I realized something. We've done something right. We've done something right as a family. We've done something right as a church. We've done something right in the kingdom of God. When, when a child says, I know how to hear the heart of God. Come on. And I wonder what would happen as we as adults in this place today would know and take the time to press our ear to our Father's heart again and hear what He's saying. It's not just knowing His words. It's actually knowing the intent of His heart. Do we believe His word? Are we just discussing it? I will tell you today that I believe Him more today than I've ever believed Him before. I remember a story that I actually believe I heard Pastor B talk about one time. And he said there was a woman who would come to church and she would sit on the third row of the center aisle and she would always sit in the second seat and wouldn't let anybody sit next to her. People would come, they would try to sit there. She'd say, you can't sit there, that's my husband's seat. People thought she was the cranky church lady. But for 18 years, she sat on the, on the third row in the second seat and wouldn't let anybody else sit on the center aisle. She would run them off. That's not, you can't sit there. That's my husband's seat. And for 18 years, nobody ever sat next to her. People thought she was crazy. People thought she was mean. People thought she was just ignorant. People thought she just didn't like people, didn't want anybody sitting around her. But nobody ever asked her why. And here was the why. Because when she got born again, the Lord said, it'll take a while, but I want you to start going to church and I want you to save the seat next to you for your husband. Her husband was an alcoholic. He was abusive verbally. And she contended for 18 years. Every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, every special meeting. She wouldn't let anybody sit in that seat because that was her husband's seat. For 18 years, people thought she was cranky, she was crabby, she was whatever. But there came a day in the third song of worship one day where her husband walked through the center, uh, through, the, through the middle doors, and she came, he came and sat next to her. And the promise he made her was, your husband will come and sit next to you, and then your whole family will come after them. And all of a sudden, her whole family got saved after her husband got saved. I don't know about you, I don't like waiting 18 seconds or 18 minutes or 18 days for a prophecy let alone 18 days or 18 years. She knew what I've been preaching to you this morning. Let us hold fast our confession again to hope for He who made the promise is faithful. And I don't know when, God, but I will not get weary in well-doing for you who made the promise is faithful and true. I don't know when He said it to you. I don't know by whom He said it to you. I don't know where He spoke it to you. If he said it, he will do it. 
Galatians 6 and 9. It says, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning. Somebody has lost heart. Somebody's lost heart. You're in a moment like David encountered in Psalm chapter 20, uh, 27, 13. When he said, my heart would have failed me for fear. Had I not believed that I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Some of you are about to lose heart. But can I tell you this morning, you're about to see the goodness of God. You're about to see the goodness of God. In the land of the living, not just in the sweet by and by, but in the right here and the right now. Some of you in this room, you're about to have a Selah moment. I love the word Selah. If you read through the Psalms, you'll find it in, often in the side notes where it, it'll just say Selah. And we've been taught to, to think about it, to ponder it, to meditate on it, that this is an important statement or an important principle or an important word. And that word has always intrigued me and a while back, I did a study on it, and this is what I found. It didn't just mean to ponder it or meditate on it or to think about it, but it also means this, a comma. It means when the world or the enemy puts in a period and says it's over, God inserts a comma and says, to be continued. And some of you in this place today, you've come to a Selah moment. You've come to a place where, where the enemy said it's over. They're not getting saved. They're not getting healed. Uh, they're, they're not going to come to the Lord. They're going to be institutionalized. You're going to go bankrupt. All of those things. Today, God is bringing you into a Selah moment and a comma is coming. And you're about to step into a to be continued moment. Come on, miracles are what God does. Impossible is where God begins. If you're facing something impossible today, I would tell you that you're not in a bad place. You're actually in a good place. If you're backed up against a mountain called impossible today, can I tell you something? There's only one way to go, and that's up. God's about to bring you on the up. Philippians 1, 3 to 6 says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making a request for you, all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I am here to tell you right now, whatever he began in you, he will complete it. He is not the God of the half-finished He's not the God of, of, of just in part, but He's the God who sees in the whole. And I'm telling you right now, there's about to be a new measure of wholeness and fullness in our lives. He who began his, the good work in you is faithful to complete it and to keep you. Some of you right now, you've wondered why you couldn't walk away, run away, hide. Because He was keeping you. He was keeping you to the day that he talked about from the, before the foundations of the earth. Aren't you glad he keeps you? He's keeping me. First King, King 17, 1 through 24. Uh, I've been in this passage for about six or seven months. I actually cannot get out of it. Every day I, I try to read something else. I read something else and I come back to this. And I believe it's actually a prophetic word for the moment in time that we are living in as believers and the moment of time that we're living in as Jubilee. First uh, Kings 17, 1 through, uh, it's going to be long, 1 through 24, but you'll like it, I promise. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these days except at my word. Now, I want you to know that um, Elijah's got some chutzpah. He's got some Holy Ghost guts. He, he is not a wimpy, wimpy, wimpy prophet. He is not fearful. He doesn't duck and run. Listen, he, he is about to give a word to one of the most evil men of all history. Ahab, King Ahab is a bad dude. There, there have been evil kings, but Ahab kind of tops them all, in my opinion. And to make it worse, Ahab actually sleeps with Jezzy. He's married to Jezebel. She has his heart, she has his ear, and he does whatever she wants him to do. He's controlled, manipulated. He's a bad dude on his own, but you connect Jezzy to it, and all hell breaks loose. And Elijah gets this word. 
He doesn't run away from it. Now, if I had that word, I might just prefer to send it by Facebook Messenger. A text message. An anonymous email. If I want enough time to run, I'll send it by the mail or US, you know, Federal Express or UPS. But, but he stands. I can, just picture, I can just picture Elijah standing in front of Ahab. And this is what he says. I love it. As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. He is so confident that he's speaking from God. He doesn't even say, I'm speaking for God. He said, it's not going to happen. Nothing's going to change until I say so. How many know if you give a word like that, you might need to go and witness protection? You might not need to get out of Dodge, you might not need to get out of the, the city. You might want to think about running and getting away in the night. So he gives this word, and I love this. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Sometimes, you go, sometimes the word of the Lord will come to you. I love those moments. I love those moments where I'm sitting in a place and nobody knows me. And somebody calls me out and gives me a word. The word comes to me. I love being in those moments in my quiet time when I'm spending time with the Lord and, and He speaks to me and the word comes to me. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook and I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. How many know you better trust God if you get a prophecy like this? Like, I have just given this word to the most evil man that's ever lived in my day. Now the word of the Lord comes to me and tells me to go hang out by a brook. And ravens are coming to feed me. Requires trust. Why? I don't know about you. I've never seen an eagle or a raven or any other, a hawk or any other bird of prey sharing their meal with anybody. I've seen them fighting off. I've seen them fighting so they have all for themselves. And he commands the ravens to feed him. The word came to him. Then I, I love this. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. There's an exchange. There's a back and forth. Sometimes the word comes to you, but sometimes you've got to go to the word. By the way, how many know that Jesus always has something to say? You want to know why? He's the word. Jesus always has something to say. He, he is the word. And he comes with the word. And then Elijah says, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. And he, he, he goes and does according to the word of the Lord. For he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. I imagine him getting like a coconut cup and making himself a little umbrella out of leaves. And just kind of like, hey, this water's pretty good. Tells the ravens in the morning, hey, I'll take some bread. And in the evening, I'll take some meat. And he's fed at 7 and he's fed again at 5. He's got a pretty good deal going, right? He doesn't have to move. He, he's probably getting comfortable while he's hiding out. God's sustaining him. God's protecting him. God is hiding him. God is providing for him. He's feeding him. He's, he, he's, he's refreshing him. And then all of a sudden, it says this. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up. Listen to me, church. God will often bring you to a place for a season. And he purposes that it would dry up after a little while. Because your destiny is not there. And unless that brook dry up, you'll stay in the wrong place. You'll stay in the place of being sustained instead of going to the place of abundance. You'll stay in the place of just making it instead of going into the place of destiny and purpose. And just because God brings you to a place for a season, that season may be to protect you. Egypt was a place where Mary and Joseph brought Jesus for protection. But how many know destiny wasn't in Egypt? Are you hearing me this morning? And some of you have, have, have pitched your, made your camp and pitched your tent right there because the water's flowing and the ravens are feeding and it looks pretty good. And it's a part of the plan, but it's not the plan. Are you hearing me? 
And some of you are walking through a dry season right now, and it's not because you've done anything wrong. It's just that God's moving you. It's just that God is transitioning you into another place and dimension of His heart, another place and dimension uh, of your relationship with Him. And I'm just telling you right now, God wants to bring us into the place of discomfort. Here's what I believe. We've become way too predictable. Last year, in the beginning of the year, I asked the Lord what He wanted from me, and He said, I want you to stop predicting me. And I thought that was an odd word to give a prophetic guy, because my job is kind of predicting God. God's about to. God's going to. He said, I want you to stop predicting me and start enjoying me. Stop trying to predict me. And he just said the church has become too predictable. Case in point. Last Sunday I decided not to sit on the left side in the third or fourth row where I normally sit. Came to first service, I actually sat in the fifth row and I sat in the middle. And no kidding, I had five people come to me and said, is everything all right? You're not supposed to be sitting here, you're supposed to be sitting over there. And I realize that when I'm home, I've become very predictable. Why would I sit differently? Because sometimes I want to check something else out. I want to get around some other people. I want to meet some other people. And when we become predictable and comfortable, guess what happens? We create our own little bubble. And we always associate with what we know and what we feel safe with. When God wants to assimilate us and connect us to people that look different, talk different, act different, that come from different cultures, like different foods. Are you hearing me? And God is moving us. He's shifting us. He's, the place where we once were is, is, is now about to dry up because there had been no rain in the land. What happened? He became the recipient of his own prophecy to Ahab. You know what I'd have done? If he wanted to stay comfortable, he would have said, Okay, Ahab, it's going to rain now because I don't want to move. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I've commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand as well. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. It's crazy, isn't it? The Lord gives him a word. Go to Zarephath. When you get to the gate at Zarephath, there is a widow woman there and I've commanded her to meet your needs. I've told her all about it. She's going to feed you water. You take care of you. But when he gets to the gate, there's a widow woman there, but she didn't get the memo. She wasn't waiting with, here's your water and here's your bread. She, she didn't get the memo yet. What happened? He, he had to act on the word. You're not hearing me. I think what happens is we take this passive case, sera, sera approach to prophecy sometimes. And we think that I'm just going to show up and you're going to see me and have this aha moment. But sometimes I've got to actually step out and activate my faith. I've actually got to ask for something. And he asks for water. She gives him water. And hey, while you're in the kitchen, can you, can you bring me a sandwich? I could, just, I could just hear him. She's saying, hey, look, dude. I got this little bit of flour, a little bit of oil. I'm about to make a cake, a piece of bread for me and my son. We're going to eat it, and we're going to die. She'd lost hope. She'd lost breath. She, she was just coming to the place. She was coming to the end. Where are you today? What's in your hand? What's in your hand? What do you think that you've come to the end with that God's saying, comma, new beginning? And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. 
And afterward, make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour will not, dry, will not be used up, nor the jar of oil run dry, until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and her household ate for many days. How many know that's nothing short of miraculous? She was just trying to get something for her and her son. For the last meal, for the last supper. The Bible says, but for many days, the oil didn't run out, the flour didn't run out, and her and her household, her extended family, and Elijah ate for many days. Can I tell you something? Don't underestimate the power of your obedience. There is a ripple effect of glory to your obedience. There could be a windfall in this place today. One act of obedience can actually open up the heavens and release your entire family into the kingdom. It can move the whole hand of God, not just for you, but everybody connected to you. That's what this miracle did. Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. And his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, What have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? And he said to her, Give me your son. So he took him out of her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. Hear me. This woman was a woman of a different faith. She was always referring to it as as your God, not my God, not our God. It was always your God. And she saw the miracles of God, but she didn't taste of the goodness of God. She saw the miracle of the bread and the oil and the flour, but she didn't encounter, she didn't feel like she encountered the goodness of God. When all these miracles had transpired, and her son is sick and, and dies in her arms. She comes back to Elijah and said, Did you come all this way? Did all this stuff happen just to remind me of, of my sins and shortcomings and, and to kill my son? Listen. It is imperative as supernatural, spirit-filled believers not to just walk in the power of God, but to display the goodness of God. Are you hearing me? Because it's His goodness and His kindness that draw people to repentance, that actually bring change. I love miracles. They do get people's attentions. But how many miracles happen in the ministry of Jesus where people just walked away? I'm looking forward to the day where miracles and the goodness and the glory of God are poured out in Pensacola and nobody can forget about it and nobody can run away from it because they're completely surrounded by it. And here's what Elijah does. He he doesn't say, hey, let me call somebody for you. I'm so sorry that your baby's dead. Thanks for the food. I'm out of here. But he said, give me your son. He, He actually takes responsibility for the problem. What would happen if the church took responsibility for what's happening in Pensacola and the United States of America and in the, in the state of Florida or what's happening in the earth? What if we actually said, hey, bring to me all of your dead things. Bring me all of your problems. I'm going to take responsibility for them. And I can't really change anything, but I'm going to bring them into my own room. I'm going to take them on for myself. And he, he lays this baby, this dead baby, this lifeless baby on his own bed. Powerful to me. There's something that happens when we take responsibility for what we say, when we take responsibility for what we represent, when we take responsibility for prophetic words that we've given. So he took him out of her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his own bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? And he did something. And I heard Pastor Angela share this in, in, a, in a breakout session in our October conference last year. And he stretched himself out on the child three times. Here's what we are called to do as Jubilee. Here's what we're called to do as the body of Christ. Here's what we're called to do as believers. To stretch ourselves out over every dead thing. To stretch ourselves out over every impossible situation. To stretch ourselves out over the ones that don't smell right, act right, look right. Our anointing, our job is to stretch ourselves out and cover that 
which looks like it's broken and dead until life comes back into it. And here's what I love about the story. He didn't just stretch himself out once or twice. He stretched himself out three times. What do you do when you don't see the miracle the first time? What do you do when you don't see it the second time? Come on, there is an anointing and there is a tenacity that God is calling us to stretch ourselves out again and again and again until life comes. And he stretched himself out on the child three times. And he cried out to the Lord and said, Oh Lord my God, I pray let this child's soul come back into him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. And those are powerful words. The word came to him. He went to the word. But now the Lord is saying, I hear you loud and clear, Elijah. My prayer is that in this house, God would say, I I hear you, David Wagner. I hear you, Angela Fox. I hear you, Pastor Darlene. I I hear you, Tom. I I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. And the soul of the child came back to him. And he revived. Anybody else praying for revival? Revival in Pensacola, revival in our community, revival in America, revival in the earth. Here's the secret to revival. God cannot revive anything that's not already dead. So what part of me must die so revival can come to my life? What ambition, what aspiration, what thing in me has to be removed so God can breathe? And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, see, your son lives. Then the woman said to Elijah, by this I know, not by the flour, not by the bread, not by the oil, but by this I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. You know what he did? He built relationship with somebody that was outside of his sphere of influence, outside of his comfort zone, so that a son could live, so that she could build trust. And all of a sudden it went from your God to our God. And some of you right now, you're about to see the glory of God in such display, the power of God in such display, that you'll see all the people around you to be clear. It's going to go from your God to our God. Come on, miracles are what God does, but impossible is where God starts. I I believe it with all my heart. How many know it was nothing short of miraculous to provide for this family with oil and flour that didn't run out? That oil sustained them, and that flour sustained them, and that bread sustained them. But how many know in the midst of it, after a miracle happened, the baby still died? What do you do when your miracle needs a miracle? What do you do when you've seen the hand of God move and you've seen Him heal cancer and you've seen Him heal people's hearts and you've seen Him heal diabetes and you've you've seen Him do all of these things? What do you do when your miracle needs a miracle? What do you do when you saved yourself your whole life for a Boaz and you get married and eight years in, depression settles in and Boaz becomes broke as? Starts acting dumbass. It's with an AZ, not the other way. You respond a little bit better than nine o'clock. He was your miracle when you married him. What do you do when your miracle needs a miracle? What do you do when... You're barren. And you're past childbearing years, and you've asked God for a son. And when it seems impossible, you have a son. And 18 years later, that miracle becomes addicted to heroin and runs the streets and prostitutes himself out. He was your miracle 18 years ago. Is he your problem, or is he, does your miracle just need a miracle? 
What do you do when God gives you a business idea and for 10 years you prosper but recession and the economy changes and, and you feel like you're tanking and you're on the brink of bankruptcy and suddenly you're questioning, was this God or was this the enemy setting me up for failure? It was your miracle 10 years ago, but, but, but now your miracle just needs a miracle. There was a young man that was 26 years old that struggled with mental illness. One day he just got to the end of his rope and took a bunch of pills and laid down to die. They found him. They resuscitated him. He spent two and a half days in a coma and they called the guy's mom and said, you might as well forget you ever had this son. He won't walk or talk. The mother begins to cry out. God, you gave him to me and I give him back to you. I named him David because I always believed he'd be my first shepherd boy. What do you do when your miracle needs a miracle? I'm that miracle. I was the 26-year-old strung out. When a mama just got a hold of God said, make my son a miracle. What do you do when your miracle needs a miracle? What do you do when you've seen the miracles of God over and over again, but the doctor's report still comes? What do you do when your miracle needs a miracle? As I close this morning, now afternoon, before Pastor Len went on his trip, he slipped me a 50 and said, if you can preach really long so that when I come back, everybody thinks I preach short, it'd be great. So that's why I'm going. We're... Two years ago, two days before Thanksgiving, November of 2016, uh, I was home watching my boys like I am this weekend and my three boys were out on the trampoline uh, playing and I got distracted, caught up in Instagram, uh, watching how you live your life vicariously on social media. And um, all of a sudden, my son came running in. Uh, his arm was flailing like this and my son Josh is 12, he was 10 at the time, starts screaming out, Caleb broke my arm, he broke my freaking arm. And uh, I don't know where he learned to talk like that, but since my wife's out of town, I guess he learned it from her. Um, if you're watching, baby, I never said it. And um, just clip that. And, um, uh, and so uh, his arm is hanging. And, and the man in me just said, you know what, this is, this is just a bag of frozen peas, a little prayer, a hug, you know, sit in my chair for a few minutes, he'll be all right. And uh, I'm looking at this thing, and the peas aren't working. And wisdom comes to me in the form of a 17-year-old boy named Benjamin. And Ben says, hey, Dad, um, do you think you should take him to the hospital? And I, I think that's wisdom. And, and so I think to myself, the man in me thinks I could get him to the hospital and back before Molly gets home. So I'm, I'm, I'm seatbelting him into my truck, and we're getting ready to go to the Sacred Heart. And um, wisdom comes to me again in the form of a 17-year-old boy. I says, should I call Mom or are you? And uh, wisdom got the best of me, and I, I called her, and I said, baby, I, um, you know, I don't want you to worry, but you know, Caleb and, and Josh were on the trampoline, and uh, Josh, uh, Caleb dropped Josh, and Josh broke his arm, uh, you know, dropped on his arm, and they heard a pop and a snap, and a kind of sound like Rice Krispies, and, and I, I've done the peas, and I've done the prayer, and uh, nothing's worked, so I'm going to Sacred Heart, don't worry, I, I'll, I'll let you know when everything's done. And she goes, oh, 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 oh well... Where, where, where were you? And I said, baby, this is not about me. This is about our son who is in deep distress and pain at the moment. And, and I, I got him to sacred and she met me there. And we walked in and the triage nurse looked at him and said, oh. And I don't think she was trained to do that, but she recognizes Houston, we have a problem. Uh, we went right back into the, uh, into the exam rooms and, you know, and, and the nurse came in and the doc came in and the radiologist came in. Even before they did, uh, the x-rays are like, oh, this is surgery. And Josh said, no, I'm not having surgery. Now you have to understand Josh's tenacity. When Josh was born on November 1st, 2005, he was born with a cord wrapped around his neck three times and 
He didn't breathe for about three to five minutes. I held his toes and spoke life until he screamed out the greatest scream I've ever heard in my life. For every day, for the 12 years of his life, this is what I tell him every morning and every night, and probably 20 times during the day, I say, Joshua Timothy Wagner, do you know that you're my miracle boy? It's who you are. You are my miracle boy. It's who he is. He also likes to throw in there, his, you know, I'm his, you know, he's my favorite, but I don't let him stay there too long when the others are listening, but he kind of is sometimes. And, um, and so um, they're talking surgery, and I'm thinking they're just going to give him some happy juice, and we're going to get the x-ray. They're gonna, and he, he said, Dad, I, I'm not having surgery. I said, I said, buddy, I said, these doctors know what they're doing. They do this all the time, right, Doc? And, and the doc says, yeah, in fact, I've done three of these today. And he said, Dad, I'm not having surgery. See, he's tired. He's done three of these today. <laughs> and, and I said, buddy, look, they're going to give you some medicine. It's going to make you feel really good. You're going to go to sleep. You're going to wake up. You're going to have a cool scar that you can make up all kinds of stories about when you get older. You're going to have a cast, and girls are going to write their names and phone numbers on there. It's going to be real cool for middle school. It's going to be awesome. And he grabbed me by my shirt, and he said, Dad, what have you called me every day of my life? And I said, Josh, you're my miracle boy. Then he said, then why is today any different? Why is today any different? I don't need you to pray some mamby-pamby prayer, and I don't need you to tell me that everything's going to be all right and God uses doctors. I need you to pray like the day I was born and I wasn't breathing. What do you do when your miracle needs a miracle? And I think what happens is this, is we just have these comfort levels. And this requires an aspirin, and this requires an urgent care visit, and this may be the emergency room, and this really requires God. And I, I love doctors, don't get me wrong. I believe that God uses medicine and miracles. But I also believe that God meets us in our place of faith. And my son had tenacity that day. It cost me an extra thousand dollars. I had to ask for another x-ray. The first x-ray, there were three breaks. And they were all kind of, they said they're going to have to put plates and, 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 and screws and all kinds of things in there. The second x-ray showed that everything was perfectly set. We went home that day in just a sling. He had a cast for three weeks, completely healed. What do you do when your miracle needs a miracle? I think sometimes we don't ask for miracles because we're afraid of being disappointed. Here's where I'll close. Have you ever asked God to do something? It didn't come quite, didn't quite come through like you wanted it. Did you ever stand and believe and believe and believe? Nothing changed. Have you ever got to that place where you knew that you knew that you knew that you heard God? And the people you were praying for died anyway. It creates disappointment, doesn't it? And it makes it easier to trust in something else than to be disappointed again. I'm a little tender. Many of you have been here for a long time. Some of you, you're new. But Pastor Ballinger was like a dad to me. When he had cancer, I, I remember standing here. I would prophesy and prophesy and prophesy. You're going to live, you're going to live, you're going to live. I stood on Psalm 118 and I believe I heard God about it. When they moved him into hospice, I was up at the, I was in hospice and Kevin Leal was there and he said, what should I tell people? It's a wrong moment. Can I just be real, just real quick? He said, what do you want me to tell people? Because people are saying you're a false prophet. People say you miss God. What do you want me to tell them? And I said, tell them whatever you want to. He said, oh, no, man, this is what I'm telling him. 
that we've got to hear prophecy through Hebrew eyes. That when Moses got a word, we all got a word. And he said, you know that Pastor B would slap you if you said he was dying or is going to die. Because we go from life to life, not life to death. And it changed my perspective. And for whatever reason, Pastor wouldn't let me stay home. I, I wanted to stay home, but I knew he wanted me to go do what I, he trained me to do. And so I went to Holland with Molly and Era, and we went. And I got the news about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, right before my 2 o'clock meeting. And I told the pastor, the pastor said, hey, do you still want to preach? I said, I think so. And I collected myself, and I just simply said, Lord, I'll preach whatever you want me to do today. I just don't want to preach about healing. He said, no, you're going to preach on healing. And I said, Lord, you didn't get the memo. I said, I'm going to preach anything you want me to preach. I'm just not preaching on healing. Here's why. I believe it. I just don't have the faith for it today. I believe you're a healer. My belief didn't change. But my faith was just filled with a little bit of disappointment today. And the Lord has this way. I came up with this great, uh, this great word on prophecy. You'd have loved to hear it. But this man comes in. He's about six foot seven. He's a Dutch guy. And he comes to the pastor and he just says, Hey, Matthias, do you believe in miracles? And Matthias said, Yeah. See him all the time. And he points to me, says, this guy really sees him. And he said, good, my wife's out in the car. She's six months pregnant. They said, the baby's dead. If they don't get the baby out today, she's going to die too. Mateus says, go get him. We'll pray for him. They come in. I went to the bathroom. I didn't have to go. I just didn't have the faith for it. I'm being brutally honest and raw with you this morning. Because I can act like I'm this mighty man of faith and power for the hour. And I, I have. I've seen a lot of great things. But it would be wrong for me to tell you all of my great successes without letting you know that, that, that there's times I've struggled as well. And I hid out in a stall. And he sent somebody in there and they said, Dave. And I said, Dave's not here. <laughs> and uh, they kept coming back. Mateus wants you. I said, tell Mateus I'm not coming. So no, Mateus wants you. And they finally, they just pounded on the door till I came out. So I, I wanted to just, I said, okay, Mateus, you pray. I'm going to just be the catcher. And I'll agree with whatever you pray. And he prays for a minute, and then he hands me the microphone. And I said, I said, and, and you can't tell a Dutch guy no. And so he, I take it, and, and I was just going to pray, you know, like, God, just heal, do a miracle. And all of a sudden, these words come out of me. You're going to live and not die. The baby's going to live and not die. And the baby's going to go full term. And when the baby is born, she's going to come out singing and not crying. And you're going to see your, your parents who don't know the Lord come to the Lord. The doctor's even going to cry, give his life to the Lord. And, and this one's going to carry salvation and restoration. The Lord overrode my words. Three months later, in September of 2014, I received an email with this beautiful baby girl with this report. Just like God said, she came out singing and not crying. My parents gave their life to the Lord. The doctor got saved, the nurse got saved, and the whole room was filled with the presence of God. Here's why I'm sharing it with you. Because the enemy's biggest tactic to the believer is disappointment. When Goliath looked at David, when he looked at the army of Israel and said, you are nothing, you are weak, I'm going to overtake you, you are dogs, you're going to be our slaves. He, he, what, his size didn't matter, his sword didn't matter, but he was defeating them with discouragement and disappointment. And I'm here to declare over you today, no more death by discouragement, no more death by disappointment, that God is releasing the anointing to believe again and to have faith again, because he who made the promise is faithful. He who made the promise is faithful. And I am persuaded, 100%, fully persuaded, that He is a healer, that He is a miracle-working God. That in this moment, you may say, I've seen a miracle, but my miracle needs a miracle. Today is the day of the miracle. Today is the day of salvation. I'll end with this. I was in London, England two months ago. There was a line of people I was tired. And I wanted to say, hey everybody, come back tonight. 
This is what Jesus said to me. I never told anybody to come back tomorrow. Jesus, you'll never find it in Scripture. Jesus never ever told anybody, come back tomorrow. Come back to my meeting. Come back to my service. Come back. They came up from behind. They they surrounded him when he was on vacation, when he was just trying to get away, when he was just trying to get by himself. When he was drained of everything physically, they would come around him. And he never said, come back tomorrow. Here's why. Because he said this. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. And I don't know who I'm prophesying to this morning. But today is the day for your miracle. Today, God has a miracle for your miracle. Today is the day of salvation. As I do finally complete my closing. If you're in this room today, you say, Dave, I hear you. And I've seen miracles and I've expected things. But my miracle needs a miracle. Maybe it's with a son or a daughter. Maybe it's with a parent. Maybe it's a physical issue today. I'm confident of this one thing. Today, God has a miracle for your miracle. If I'm talking to you, I know it's late. I want you to get out of your seat and come to the front of this place. You're crossing over to the place of no return. You're you're leaving, what was? You're leaving the place of discouragement. You're leaving the place of disappointment. You're leaving that place where it seems like everything else has failed. There's a river flowing up here from the bottle of water. You think it'll never run out. If I'm talking to you today, there's a miracle for your miracle. Some of you are afraid to believe again. Some of you are afraid to ask again. Some of you have been taught like this. Well, you only have to ask one time. Some of you may feel like, oh, if I don't ask, I won't get disappointed. A couple of years ago, I was in a coffee shop with a Baptist pastor friend of mine. and He said, you know the problem with you crazy charismatics? And I said, nope, but I'm sure you're going to tell me. He said, you put too much pressure on God when he doesn't do what you want him to do. You get disappointed. I smiled at him. I said, do I look disappointed to you? And the Holy Spirit just baptized him right there in the diner. Baptized him in the Holy Spirit and power. Broke off discouragement. And I believe right here in this moment, right here in this moment, there's a miracle for your miracle. That discouragement is leaving you. I I believe the Lord brought us to this place today. When it's an amazing day, It's an amazing day. There's no greater day to be alive than right here and right now. And when I believe right now that there's a miracle for your miracle, I believe, I don't care how many times you've asked and asked again, today's the day of salvation. Today's the day of salvation. When I believe He can move mountains, I believe He can raise the dead and heal the sick. I believe He can make the vilest offender clean. I believe the blood of Jesus is still more than enough. I feel the determination of heaven that he has determined that you would have everything that he paid for at the cross. Your healing, your sound mind, your provision, your freedom. It's all here today. Receive this the same way you got saved. You just believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. You just believe that today's the day. Father, in the name of Jesus, I couldn't wait to preach this message. Because I know this is a now word for a now time, for now people. I don't apologize for my tears. I don't apologize for my tenderness. I don't apologize for the reality and the vulnerability of my stories. Lord, so Lord, I've tested you and proved you for 20 years in this place. I can honestly say over and over and over again, you have been faithful. Feel this faithfulness in the room. If I could somehow let you feel what I'm feeling. 
I feel him in here today. I feel his faithfulness like I've never felt it before. I feel his goodness. His loving kindness. It's better than life. Come on, I believe right now there's healing all over this place. Healing of physical things and things that can't even be seen. I believe there's healing for diagnosed things and undiagnosed things. I believe every depression's coming off of you. Every discouragement, every disappointment is being broken off you today. Come on, my God. I feel him in here today. I feel him right now. Come on, ministry team. Need people to help me pray this morning. Holy Spirit, right now, would you move with power, with might? Would you come, Lord? Come just like you promised. Lord, thank you for Mary Lynn, Lord. Winds of change. Winds of change. There's some divine appointments getting ready to take place for you, Mary Lynn. God's about to release breakthrough not only in the business end, but in every personal situation. And I saw like this divine touch coming on your mom. I feel like there's almost been a little bit of a worry about her. And I just felt like the Lord said, I've got her in the palm of my hand. This is going to be a season of renewal. I saw like renewal coming through your entire family for you, Gary, Nina, Jessica, your uh, Will and Anna and all that. There's a renewal that's coming, a renewal of the promises, a renewal. I don't know how to explain it, but it's like a renewal of vows. And I saw you and Gary, even in the in the marriage ministry, really, really bringing people, releasing people into like the renewal of vows and things. And I just feel like right now that today I kept hearing the Lord say, I remember, I remember, I remember, I remember. And I feel like this morning, as you've heard me preach, you just started remembering promises. And the Lord said, I remember, I remember, I even remember the things that you've forgotten. And Lord, right now I release the miracle of miracles, Lord, the miracle for her miracles, Lord, the miracle for her miracles, Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, Lord, I release right now your miracle hand over my sister today. Lord, let there be an unlocking, an awakening, God, that takes place in her today. Lord, I thank you for a shift, a divine shift that's taking place, Lord. Lord, that you would open the heavens over her life. That, Lord, the season of start, stop, start, stop are over. That, Lord, you're getting ready to move with your power. You're getting ready to move, Lord, in her family. You're getting ready to move, Lord, upon the daughters and sons. You're getting ready to move, Lord, in her household. Lord, I thank you right now for this season of peace, that, 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 that power, that peace is power in this season, Lord. I feel like the Lord has been teaching you when to speak and when to be quiet. And I feel like sometimes wisdom is, you found wisdom in the quiet. The Lord says, if you hold your peace, I'll release my wisdom. And I saw divine strategies coming to you. And it's like literally I saw doors being unlocked. That which you were kind of like trying to beat down, you were knocking on it and nothing would open. I feel like the Lord is about to tear them off their hinges in the days that are ahead. Lord, I thank you right now for the more, for the more, for the more. Lord, I thank you right now, Lord, for my, uh, for your amazing daughter. Lord, I thank you that, Lord, today, that, Lord, you've come with your strong right hand. That, Lord, you've anointed her to be bold and courageous, Lord. That, Lord, you're bringing her. I, I just felt like you, it was almost like you've been on the threshing floor. And you, at times just felt like trampled on over and over again. And I saw you just picking things up that were on the floor. I saw the Lord on his knees with you picking things up. And I said, Lord, what is it? He said, I'm picking up the dreams. And it's a season where the Lord is about to restore every dream that you thought was broken. Everything that you thought was just thrown to the ground. I saw the Lord picking it up and bringing it together. This is a season where you're going to know the beauty of the potter's wheel of the Lord. And Lord, I just declare right now that this would be a summer of breakthrough and significance and supernatural breakthrough and an outpouring of your spirit. Lord, I thank you right now for promotion. Lord, in the natural and in the spirit, Lord. Lord, I thank you right now that, Lord, you're bringing her out of transition and out of the temporary. Lord, into the place of your glory, into the place of your goodness, God. Lord, I thank you right now that, Lord, this is a season of exceeding abundant joy. Lord, I thank you for the joy of the Lord that's about to bubble up in her like never before. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, prophesy, prophesy, prophesy. Prophesy to the four winds. Prophesy to the four winds. Prophesy to that which seems impossible. Daughter, I have created you for this hour. I've created you for this season that looks impossible to many, but it's possible for you. And I saw you walking out of the ashes. I saw you walking, like rising like a phoenix 
out of ashes. And I felt like the Lord said, you were anointed to be my voice. The voice of the Lord is about to roar in you like never before. Father, in Jesus' name, breakthrough in every area. Breakthrough financially. Breakthrough relationally, God. Breakthrough, Lord, right now. Let the lion of the tribe of Judah roar on the inside of her. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for Samara. Lord, I thank you for the miracle, for every miracle. Lord, the miracle for her miracle today. Lord, I thank you right now that, Lord, you have clothed her with righteousness. You have adorned her, Lord, with with, with beauty. You have adorned her with an anointing. And uh, Samara, I just saw the Lord stretching out his hand. And I asked the Lord what he was doing. He said, healing. And I saw that scripture in Acts. It said, Lord, stretch forth your hand to heal that we might have boldness to preach the gospel. And I feel like there's boldness coming because you're about to see healing in ways you've never seen it before. And Lord, I thank you right now for divine appointments for Samara in this season. Lord, every disappointment, every discouragement, Lord, I break it off today. And Lord, I say, Lord, bring her from faith to faith and glory to glory, faith to faith and glory to glory, God. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Lord, right now, Lord, I pray uh, uh, for my sister. Lord, I pray right now for Savannah. That, Lord, that you would open up the windows of heaven. You would open up, Lord, every portal over her life. And, Lord, I thank you that, Lord, she's not going to be leading from behind anymore. But you've called her to go ahead. I don't know how to explain it, Savannah, but I saw the Lord bringing you to the front of the line. And I felt like the Lord said that this is a season where he's not looked over you, but he's looking right at you. And the Lord's about to make a supernatural way for you. And I, I felt like the Lord brought you in to like the creative room of heaven and I saw you beginning to write and I saw you beginning to draw and I saw you beginning to come up with the blueprints of what the next three and five years looks like and the Lord says that today you're going from you're, I'm bringing you from the place where you felt like you were stuck and I just felt like the Lord was about to cause there to be divine movement Lord I, Lord, I just thank you right now for divine shift taking place uh, for Savannah today in Jesus name Lord release the miracle for her miracle Lord right now in Jesus name Lord, I thank you right now for Hannah, Lord. Lord, I thank you that, Lord, you have destined her, Lord, for glory. You have destined her to release your glory and your kingdom in the earth. And, Lord, I thank you that, Lord, you've given her a prophetic sword. Lord, you've given her a a sword that takes off the hand of the enemy. And, uh, Hannah, I I feel like you've been anointed to make this the worst day the enemy's ever had. That you've been anointed that every day to, to make every day the worst day the enemy has ever had. And I feel like that this is a season where God's about to flex his muscles on the inside of you. And it's like I saw you like punching through a ceiling, punching through a glass ceiling. And it was like you could see what was on the other side, but you couldn't get to it. And today the Lord is shattering the glass ceiling where you are concerned. And I saw the Lord opening up supernatural doors for you, doors of influence, doors of breakthrough. And I felt like the Lord said, I kept you, I kept you hidden. And I've given you the grace where you weren't really moved and didn't care really about the 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 opinions of people because you had a more sure word of prophecy. And this is the word that I have for you. I am well pleased with you. And I feel like the Lord said, no, there have been some who did not know what to do with the directness. They didn't know what to do with, with, with the way that you just, you, you would speak. But the Lord said, they're going to begin to recognize an authority coming up on the inside of you. And so Lord, I thank you for divine authority that you're releasing to Hannah in this season. In Jesus' name, Lord, I thank you right now, Lord. Lord, Nicole, Lord, I thank you for your hand on her life. Lord, I, I just saw you like... Um, you look like a scout where you had your hand over your eyes and you were just looking out on the horizon. And I felt like the Lord said that he wants you to look for what hasn't been seen yet. He wants you to see what has never been seen before. And uh, Lord, I just ask right now, God, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit, Lord, on my sister today, that Lord, you would begin to release your miracle power in her household. Lord, I thank you for the anointing for ministry. Lord, I thank you for the grace that she has with kids, Lord. I I thank you right now that, Lord, she's going to begin to see, uh, Lord, she's going to see, Uh, an anointing to to grow up big people. I just saw you raising up big people, big people in God. And Lord, I thank you right now that Lord, you have anointed her to raise up giant slayers, Lord. And you've anointed her to release the giants of this generation, Lord, to tear off the enemy's head, Lord, to take new ground for the kingdom of God. Lord, I thank you right now for your healing hand. Lord, I thank you. Uh, I don't know what it is, but I feel like there's been something really specific you've been asking God for. And he just said, it's as good as done. And uh, so Lord, I just 
just thank you right now that, Lord, for the open heavens you're bringing her into. But I, I thank you that the thing she's been asking for, that, Lord, she's about to be holding in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you for my sister today. Lord, I thank you for a miracle, for her miracle. And, Lord, I thank you that, Lord, you've anointed her to be like a jackhammer, a sledgehammer. That, Lord, she's going to break off doubt and disappointment and discouragement and depression off of people. And, Lord, today you're about to cause her to step into dancing shoes. That, Lord, you've anointed her, Lord, for a new season that's going to be like a song and a dance, a new season, Lord, uh, uh, of seeing the impossible invaded God. Lord, I ask, Lord, that you would you would use her in, in, in powerful ways. Lord, I thank you for the dreams of God becoming reality. That, Lord, there is a shift that is taking place in her life. That, Lord, today, that, Lord, the mirror, you're, you're marrying her life to the miraculous in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you right now for your daughter. And I just saw you bringing people to the well, bringing people to the river, bringing people to the brook, bringing people. I saw water all around you. And uh, there's that old saying that you can uh, bring a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. But what, what I saw was I saw everybody putting their face in the water. And I said, Lord, what is it about? And the Lord says, she's carrying refreshing. And they know that if she's gone and brought them there, it's a safe place. And I felt like the Lord said that he's anointed you uh, to be one who doesn't play it safe, but brings people in a, a safe place so that they can live dangerously for the kingdom. And I just felt like the Lord said that this is not only going to be a season of visitation, but he's about to dwell on the inside of you like, like you've never known before. And I just felt like the Lord said, get ready because uh, uh, boarding is beginning to start. And it's like I saw the boarding gates beginning to open and I saw you getting on airplanes and off airplanes and on airplanes and off airplanes. And I feel like this is a season of traveling and ministry and missions. And, and Lord, I thank you for the anointing of go, the anointing of go on her life. And Lord, for the provision that she needs to carry it out in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you right now, uh, Lord, for David and Bonnie. Lord, I thank you for the anointing that destroys every yoke upon their life. And Lord, I just declare right now that you have miracles for their miracles, miracles for their uh, for their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. But Lord, you also have miracles for them, Lord, that this is a summer, Lord, even as they've been sowing and sowing and sowing, that Lord, that seed is growing, that Lord, you're about to bring things to maturity and fulfillment. And I, I felt like I kept hearing two words over the two of you, fullness and fulfillment, fullness and fulfillment that he is bringing you to the place of the full, that you would have life and life more abundantly and life to the full. And uh, Lord, I just thank you right now that Lord, they're walking, uh, Lord, in that anointing of John 10, 10, where it says that the enemy comes to kill, steal and destroy. But you said you've come to give us life and life to the full. And what I believe is this, that you're about to destroy the works of the enemy. And I, I, saw, uh, I saw you going, it's kind of a funny picture, David. I saw you cow tipping, you know, where you, where, I heard old wives' tales about it where you go up to a sleeping cow and you just poke him and they tip over. And I, I saw you going and poking things. I said, Lord, what is it? He said, he's going to turn over sacred cows. And I feel like there's this anointing of the prophetic over you that's going to tear down just walls that the enemies, but even generational sacred cows are going to be tore down. And I, I felt like the Lord said, I love them more. I love them more. I love them more. I love them more. And you love them a lot, but I love them more. And I just feel like right now, you're about to see the love of God poured out on your kids. You're going to see the, the, the love of God poured out on your kids like never before. That this is going to be a season where God's about to bring them back into the place, not only of salvation, but of fullness and of healing and of deliverance. And I just really felt like right now that, that you, the Lord was saying, the two of you haven't seen anything yet compared to what you're about to see. And so, Lord, I just thank you right now for what they're about to see. Lord, for what they're about to see in the days ahead in Jesus name in Jesus name in Jesus name in Jesus name don't forget practical ministry on Saturday uh, don't forget surrender on Tuesday uh, at 5 30 right here men's uh, network meeting on, 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 on Wednesday night uh, it's a powerful summer God's moving all over the place and uh, Come on, it's one of those days where I just want to linger in His presence. Just want to hang out in the presence of God. Well, let this be a day that marks us, Lord. When I feel you, I feel like you're releasing us into a new season of miracles. Not just hit and miss miracles, but day by day miracles, day to day miracles. Lord, right now, in Jesus' name. Supernatural breakthrough, supernatural breaking forth. 
Shakirama Sandrava 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 Atarama Sandrava Sandrava Akarama Sandrava 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 Shakarama Sandrava 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 Akarama Sandrava 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 I saw this uh, amazing spread, this amazing table, uh, and I saw the Lord just setting all of these platters and all of these bowls and all of these uh, amazing foods on the table. Uh, and um, the thing that really took me the most was I, in this vision that I had, I could actually smell the bread. And I, I felt like the Lord said that this is the season of fresh bread for the two of you. There's fresh bread from the kitchen of heaven. There's fresh bread from Jesus, the bread of life. And I feel like the Lord has caused you guys to cross over today. Sylvia, I saw you crossing over into miracle territory. And I just felt like the Lord said that you're going to know redemption and restoration like never before. And it's like I saw the Lord sending out. It's like I saw all of these, um, these hounds out, like these blood hounds. And, and I said, Lord, what is it? He said, I'm releasing the hounds of heaven on her behalf. And it's like I saw them rounding up. I saw them rounding up everything that you thought was lost. The Lord says, I'm hot on the scent of what you thought was lost or misplaced or displaced. And I'm, I'm gathering it back. And I just really feel like right now that this is the season of gathering and the Lord's bringing you into the season of gathering and get to's the things that you love the things that you have desired to get to do and uh, Lord I just thank you right now for new realms of ministry nor new realms of connection and I feel like there's a been there's like a rewiring taking place rewiring of heart-to-heart -heart connections and Wayne I just believe right now that this is a season it's like I saw a bar uh, in like this metal bar over you and it was like a golden bar and I saw the Lord um, moving you up above it and I said Lord what is it and the Lord said I've anointed Wayne to raise the bar I've anointed him to raise the bar of what's normal or what's acceptable and, and I felt like the Lord said that he's given you the grace and the anointing to go there and the, the Lord has given the two of you uh, uh, an unoffendable spirit I feel like that you've, you've said in your hearts, purpose in your hearts, we refuse to be offended about anything. And it's like I saw the Lord releasing to you an unoffendable spirit. And that's going to be so powerful in, in the days ahead where everybody's offended by everything. That there is this grace to get people out of offense uh, and, and into the presence of God. And I, I saw you gathering people that were on the fringes, gathering people that were about to just cut and run. Uh, and, and I just saw you just restoring people to God. And uh, Lord, I thank you right now, Lord, even for the anointing of evangelism to begin to flood. I just feel like there's going to feel this urgency and this, uh, this, this flood of, of evangelism, just even one-on-one -on -one, uh, come up. And, and so, Lord, I just thank you right now for that grace. And when I, I don't know if this makes sense to you, but one of God's favorite places for you is in that old green truck with you. The Lord just loves riding with you in it. Because I feel like there was so much restoration work done on it. It's really a picture of the kingdom. And I feel like it's going to be a conversation starter. People start with, hey, what year is it? Hey, how long have you had it? You're going to tell the story behind the story. And redemption's going to come. Lord, I just bless Wayne and Sylvia today. Lord, I bless them. And they're going out and they're coming in. Lord, I just declare right now, something new is rising in them. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you right now. Lord, I thank you right now for your amazing daughter, Shirley, Lord. But I thank you that, Lord, her life is a living testament, a walking testimony of the goodness and the kindness and the grace of God. And, Lord, she's got a lot of history and a lot of miracle memories. I just saw you looking around, Shirley, and, and it's like I remember when something happened here, and I remember when something happened here, and I remember when something happened there. And I, I don't know what it is, but I felt like the Lord said that today, and I feel like you've been coming back for, for a long time, but it's almost like today you tap back into your roots. You tap back into your spiritual inheritance. You, you, you tap back in to, to what's belonged to you all, all, all the time. And um, a few uh, months ago, um, I had pneumonia. And I went to this doctor and he said, well, are you grieving? And I said, why are you asking? And he said, because grief is stored in the lungs. 
And, uh, and um, it was like revelation to me. I don't know how to explain it, but I let go of grief and it was like all of a sudden I could breathe again. And I, I just feel like that there has been this place of, of grief where there's just been losses and, and heartaches and different things. And today I saw the Lord breaking the spirit of grief off of you. And I feel like it's going to be connected to that healing that's taking place on the inside. And so, Lord, I thank you for raising her oxygen levels. But I thank you right now. Lord, I know in the natural she's walking through some physical things. But, Lord, I believe your word today. I believe your breath has come. And so, Lord, I thank you right now for that healing that you're releasing to Shirley. Lord, I, I thank you that, Lord, I, when I first got here, she was always making room for other people. And I know Pat lived with her and Joe lived with her for a while. And I'm sure others, but I've heard stories. But, Lord, I, I ask that, Lord, her oil would never run out. Her flower would never run out. Lord, that the oil would flow behind closed doors like in 2 Kings, uh, for 2 Kings chapter 4. That, Lord, you would answer her prayers like the Shunammite woman of 2 Kings 4 as well. That, Lord, right now, that, Lord, she's about to see miracles among her children and grandchildren, Lord. That, Lord, her eyes are going to see. That, Lord, you would give her the anointing of Anna. Lord, like Anna and Simeon who dedicated Jesus in the, in the temple. And they said, our eyes have seen. Our eyes have seen the promise. Lord, I thank you. That her eyes are fixed on you. But Lord, even in the natural, her eyes would see the promises of God. Lord, we bless her today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Thanks for what you're doing. Thanks for what you've done. Lord, release your miracle for our miracles this week at Jubilee. Release us into a new season of the supernatural, a summer of the supernatural. A miracle for our miracles, God. Lord, pour out your spirit. Increase. Increase in prayer tomorrow night. Increase as the ladies gather on Tuesday. Increase among the men and the youth. Lord, on Wednesday, Lord, increase in 850. Increase, God. This week, Lord, as we do practical ministry, increase, Lord, on Pastor Lynn. And, uh, increase on Aaron, Lord, as they uh, minister today in the Dominican Republic. Lord, just pour out your spirit on all of us like we've never seen before. Lord, I thank you for a fresh touch from heaven, Lord, another release of your mighty rushing wind. 